Today, I wanna to start my coping camp series with something to help us get a handle on the moment. A little bit. I feel like the maid. I just cleaned up this mess. Can we keep it clean for, for 10 minutes? <laughs> no kidding, right? Um, okay, fine. Uh, conflict resolution. Um, I take you point by point from the doctor to the father to Casey to undo burden to equal protection back to Roe, at which point you can't remember the question and I drink my water for a minute while you regroup. No, I'm good, Glenn. Right now in America, things have come to a head. Our culture has been polarizing itself for a long time. Perhaps it's always been that way. Emotions are high and we're pretty strongly divided into clear camps. We were beyond stressed already there were a few things going on right now. Economy in the tank, global pandemic. Rivers and seas boiling. 40 years of darkness, earthquakes, volcanoes. The dead rising from the grave. Human sacrifice, dogs and cats living together, mass hysteria. I get it, Dr. Venkman. We've watched all the Netflix and we're all out of chill. We are clearly in conflict. We've been in this abusive relationship for a while and the fights are always over the same stuff. Last time we tried a trial separation, Atlanta burned. I get it. You don't want to live together, but nobody wants to sell the house and move. No one is listening, and things have gotten violent. But let's be honest. Things have been violent for a long time. Right now, it's on the front lawn, in front of the neighbors. I mean, even Germany has been calling to get us to tone it down and go back in the house. Germany. Does it seem to anyone else like we're stuck in a loop? The same memes, the same stories, the same talking points on both sides, but no one is listening. If this is some kind of predestination paradox, how do we escape? How can we stop bickering like an old married couple and resolve our problems like reasonable adults again? If we don't, both parents may lose the kids in this one. Just remember, I have an army. We have a Hulk. Oh, I thought the beast had won it all. You're missing the point. There's no throne. There is no version of this where you come out on top. Now, maybe your army comes and maybe it's too much for us, but it's all on you. He's right. One side has an army, the other rage. And that rage builds when you poke it. Harlem has been broken before and it wasn't a big green monster that did it. We should just shrink back down, put on our normal sized pants, and try to think. Why are we in conflict? And how do we get out? Without making it a numbers game, I believe we can agree on some things. It is not the beginning of this conflict. Regardless of where we are on these issues, I believe we can mostly concede three points. Most of us would like to stop the violence. Most of us would like to see justice done. Most of us would like something to change. We may not agree on specifics, but we can at least agree on those three points. If you're for continued violence and injustice, I think it's unlikely you found your way here, but this is about you and you should definitely watch. If you don't think anything should change, I hope I can explain why you feel that way. I hope I can show why we're way past that option as well. In a lot of ways, this is about patterns of behavior that brought us here, but it's also about the rest of us and why we think and act so differently. First, there are a few ways in which we approach the world, take in information and form beliefs that really complicate our ability to understand each other. I think some of the biggest factors are personality, how we curate our social experiences, and how we process that experience into our own private logic, our beliefs about how the world works and our place in it. I think understanding these three things can help us to understand how we got here and how to extricate ourselves. I believe understanding each other is key to getting out of any conflict. I also think a few basic communication skills and some guidelines for argument and debate would be in order, but that is a whole nother bag of cat videos. I think before we can even start to listen again, we need to learn a little bit about ourselves and about each other. So today, part one in a 239 part series, personality. What's wrong with that guy? Or why 
can't we all just get along? Now first, personality is simply our individual pattern of thinking, feeling, and behaving. We all have a way we usually respond to people, situations, and stimuli in our world. We have our likes, dislikes, hopes, hates, and fears. It's in the technical rainbow of different factors where these things get complicated. Personality has been a focus of study for, well, forever. See, we've always wondered what's wrong with that guy. So here's a few of the high points. See, we used to think you were born with a personality or developed it as you grew up and then it was locked in for life, like filling in your character sheet in pen. That is busted. All kinds of things can change your personality. Below in the description is a link to some of the greatest hits, but the big ones, time, trauma, and therapy. First personality does naturally shift and change over time, usually varying along a theme over one's lifetime. Second, being abused, losing someone, or being exposed to traumatic events like natural disasters, violence, and such will certainly cause quick, dramatic changes in our patterns of thinking, feeling, and behaving. In extreme cases, the curve of a person's experiences and responses can be skewed out of alignment into depression, or anxiety, or PTSD. But therapy works to counteract these effects too. Studies show if you want to change something about yourself, how you think, feel, or respond, you can. For some people, it can happen over time, but counseling usually shortens that time span. Now the best model we have for explaining personality is called the five factor model. It consists of five basic dimensions, each broken down into six specific facets or traits. So 30 total. Now, I don't know how to draw a five dimensional shape. It's kind of like looking at a tesseract through a prism. Now that's why personalities are so wide and varied. Even the acronym to remember these five factors is like that too. Now you can either use ocean or canoe, but either way, on it or in it, it's a whole lot of water. Now I'm going to start in the middle and swim out until we get to shore. Now the most straightforward factor is extroversion. Most of us are familiar with it from its body of work in other popular shows such as the Myers-Briggs or the MBTI. And it illustrates how the scales work, like a character actor in a buddy flick. Extroversion is our outgoingness, our sociability, so it is easy to see on display. Someone with higher scores will display stronger extroversion facets, like warmth, gregariousness, and assertiveness. Lower scores would be more reserved and deliberate. Now, the extroversion scale shows how neither extreme is better or worse. Each has different challenges. High scores can have difficulty toning it down, or in situations not suited to their sociability, while areas of strength for lower scores would be exactly those situations. Next is conscientiousness. High levels of conscientiousness usually reflect a high level of self-discipline and impulse control. These people have a party plan rather than just showing up to see what happens. They may not act as spontaneously, but are reliable, usually more strategic thinkers. They are great employees, while low scorers are way more fun at the office party. Again, most of us lie somewhere in between these extremes. We may have some stories to tell, but we can keep it together long enough to keep our job past New Year's. Impulsivity in a conflict situation, however, can be problematic, being prone to escalation and rash behavior. And that's definitely not a plus in situations like this. Next is openness to experience. And this is a big one for conflict resolution. Openness to experience includes imagination, a sensitivity to aesthetics, attentiveness to inner feelings, a preference for variety, and a basic curiosity about the world. Now, low scores represent concrete, conventional thinking that's more down to earth than pie in the sky. But low scores can have trouble with change. They have trouble imagining what it would look like, aren't comfortable with the uncertainty and feelings it causes, and are less interested in making things better than avoiding anything getting worse. High scores, on the other hand, can be more abstract and artistic in their thinking. but 
as any artist will tell you. It's not always an advantage. That artistic eye and thirst for variety is never finished, never sated. Instead, always tweaking and critiquing. It's like a sculptor chipping away every blemish and burr until nothing remains. Are you a fighter or are you food? Agreeableness is pretty straightforward and much like art, we know it when we see it. Keep in mind, even high extremes in agreeableness can be difficult, resulting in unreasonable trust in others, people-pleasing behaviors, or being honest to a fault. That may sound better than being self-interested, skeptical, and suspicious, but trust me, both ends suck. Some people are just genuinely disagreeable folk. However, some are spoiling for a fight. It's pretty clear to see how agreeableness factors in, especially in conflict resolution. To be honest, this is one of the factors that even I struggle with more than I like. Just because I'm a counselor doesn't make me this guy. Neuroticism is a terrible word for the next category. I've seen it reskinned as natural reactions, but I think it was really important to somebody that it spelled out shield. This factor is about calm and confidence, being comfortable in one's own skin. It encompasses one's emotional stability, temperament, and how we respond to stress. High levels of neuroticism are, you know what? I'm not gonna call it that anymore. Reactivity, it's reactivity now. It's about reactivity and resilience. High scores are just more moody and prone to extremes in anger and worry, fear and frustration, guilt and depression. They respond worse to stressors and are likely to interpret situations as more threatening or more hopeless. Low scores are more even tempered and recover from stress and trauma faster, but they may experience a subdued emotional range. A little reactivity is a good thing. We want to react, to be moved by our emotions. They spur us to act, love, and live. People with low reactivity may have a restricted emotional range, neither experiencing great highs nor great lows. High levels, however, can put people at risk for mental disorders, such as PTSD or panic disorder, even substance abuse. High reactivity, especially combined with lower levels of conscientiousness, can make people volatile and prone to acting on impulse, like Nicolas Cage. Sing it for me, Kay. Your person is smart. People are dumb, panicky, dangerous animals, and you know it. True, but individually and collectively, personality is a major factor in how we interface with others, and understanding a little bit about ourselves can help us to understand how others move through the world as well. It's in the combination and extremes of these different dials and traits where conflict resolution breaks down. See, low levels of openness can result in difficulties changing one's mind. Low levels of agreeableness prevent us from even wanting to in the first place. Some combinations make the process difficult. Others make it impossible, even dangerous at truly dysfunctional levels. Some of us are simply not emotionally prepared for change. Unknowns are scary. We don't want to be scared. And even if we were, we wouldn't want to admit it to anybody. We will shuck and jive our way through all kinds of logical fallacies, emotional arguments, and talk radio bullet points to avoid feeling it. We all have had quite enough recently. And in other circumstances, who would blame people for behaving this way? Alvin Toffler called it future shock. When we reach a point where changes are coming so fast, begins to outstrip our ability to cope and adapt. You see, you can't simply pry someone open and make them change. As I said earlier, that takes time, trauma, or therapy, the Neapolitan ice cream of change. If your personality lens has gotten distorted out of alignment, it can lead to a personality disorder. And all that is, really, is a pattern of thinking, feeling, or behaving that has been so far out of alignment, it impairs your ability to function and relate with others. If you're uncomfortable, I get it, we all are, but changes are coming. It's best to get someone to help you smooth the road. 
We've given it time, but the problems remain. Now we're in trauma, and the only way to shorten the trial by fire learning process that is trauma is talk. So which is it gonna be? Now, if you watch these videos and we seem like a fit, feel free to drop me a line. If I'm not your cup of tea or not in your area, I can help you source somebody who is with a referral. As always, like, subscribe, and share so that we can see where this maniacal tune car of mental health is headed. Thanks for watching. See you next time. High levels of conscientiousness. Conscientiousness is a tough word to say. You have to be very conscientious while saying conscientiousness. Now, agreeableness. High levels of reactivity, however, put people at risk for mental disorders such as post traumatic stress. Pa! Pa, 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 can put people at risk for mental disorders such as post traumatic stress disorder. I can't say it. <laughs>